Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is November 29, 2020, and this is an audiobook of Opportunism and the Collapse of the Second International by Lenin. This text is part of a series called the Basic Marxism-Leninism Study Plan. It's a series of 26 texts. Uh, the curriculum was developed by an organization called MAI, or the Anti-Imperialist Movement. You can find a playlist for all of these videos on the Socialism for All channel under Playlists. Please listen to them in order. I am currently in the process of recording them all in my own voice with comments, uh, but I have put together most of the playlist, uh, filling in the gaps of what I, I haven't recorded with audiobooks from other channels. So this text was written at the end of 1915 and first published in Proletarche Revitutia No. 5, 1924, published according to the manuscript. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1974, Moscow. The transcription and markup was done by D. Walters and R. Simbala. It's in the public domain, Lenin Internet Archive, 2003-2005. Thanks to Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org, for putting this online and hosting it for free. Please go to Marxists.org. They have thousands of Marxist texts for free, available, arranged by author, by subject, by chronology, all kinds of different ways, so you are sure to find something that is of interest to you. Okay, so let's get into the audiobook. It is instructive to compare the attitudes of the various classes and parties towards the collapse of the international, which has been revealed by the 1914 to 1915 war. On one hand, the bourgeoisie extols to the sky those socialists who have expressed themselves in favor of, quote, defending the fatherland, i.e. in favor of the war and aiding the bourgeoisie. On the other hand, the bourgeoisie's more outspoken or less diplomatic representatives are expressing malicious joy over the collapse of the international, the collapse of the, quote, illusions of socialism. Among socialists who are, quote, defending the fatherland, there are also two shades, the, quote, extremists, like the Germans W. Kolb and W. Heine, who admit the collapse of the international for which they blame the, quote, revolutionary illusions. These are out to restore a still more opportunist international. In practice, however, they agree with the, quote, moderates, the cautious socialist, quote, defenders of the fatherland, such as Kautsky, Renadel, and Vandervelde, who stubbornly deny that the international has collapsed, consider it merely suspended temporarily, and defend the second international's viability and right to exist. Revolutionary social democrats in the various countries recognize the collapse of the second international and the need to create a third international. To decide who is right, let us examine an historic document which bears upon the present war and carries the unanimous and official signatures of all socialist parties in the world. That document is the Basel Manifesto of 1912. Noteworthy enough, no socialist would, in theory, dare deny the need for a concretely historical analysis of every war. Today, however, none but the, quote, left social democrats, who are but few in number, would be so bold as to publicly and definitely repudiate the Basel Manifesto or declare it erroneous or analyze it carefully, comparing its decisions with the conduct of the socialists after the outbreak of the war. Why is that so? It is because the Basel Manifesto ruthlessly exposes the wrong reasoning and conduct of the majority of official socialists. There is not a single word in this manifesto on either the defense of the fatherland, unquote, or the difference between a war of aggression and a war of defense. Not a syllable on a subject the official SD leaders both in Germany and in the quadruple entente have been talking and vociferating about most. In a perfectly clear, precise, and definite manner, the Basel Manifesto analyzes the concrete clashes of interests which led towards war in 1912 and brought about war in 1914. The Manifesto says that these are clashes arising on the basis of, quote, capitalist imperialism, clashes between Austria and Russia for domination over the Balkans, clashes between Britain, France, and Germany over their, quote, policies of conquest in Asia Minor, the policies of all of them, 
clashes between Austria and Italy over their attempt to, quote, draw Albania into their sphere of influence, subject her to their, quote, rule, and clashes between Britain and Germany because of their mutual, quote, antagonism, and further because of, quote, Tsarism's attempts to grab Armenia, Constantinople, etc. It will be seen that this applies in full to the present war. The undisguised predatory, imperialist, and reactionary character of this war, which is being waged for the enslavement of nations, is most clearly recognized in the manifesto, which draws the necessary conclusion that war, quote, cannot be justified on the slightest pretext of being in the least in the interests of the people, unquote. That war is prepared, quote, for the sake of the profits of capitalists and ambitions of dynasties, unquote, and that on the part of the workers, it would be, quote, a crime to fire at one another. These propositions contain the fundamentals for an understanding of the radical distinction between two great historical periods. One was the period between 1789 and 1871, when, in most cases, wars in Europe were indubitably connected with the most important, quote, interests of the people, namely a powerful bourgeois progressive movement for national liberation, which involved millions of people, with the destruction of feudalism, absolutism, and foreign oppression. It was on this basis alone that there arose the concept of, quote, defense of the fatherland, defense of a bourgeois nation that is liberating itself from medievalism. Only in this sense did socialists recognize, quote, defense of the fatherland. Even today, it must be recognized in this sense. For instance, the defense of Persia or China against Russia or Britain, of Turkey against Germany or Russia, of Albania against Austria and Italy, etc. The 1914-1915 war, as clearly expressed in the Basel Manifesto, pertains to an entirely different historical period and is of an entirely different character. This is a war among predators for division of the loot, for the enslavement of other countries. Victory for Russia, Britain, and France means the strangulation of Armenia, Asia Minor, etc. This is stated in the Basel Manifesto. Germany's victory means the strangulation of Asia Minor, Serbia, Albania, etc. This is stated in the self-same manifesto and has been recognized by all socialists. All phrases about a war of defense or about defense of the fatherland of, by the great powers, i.e. the great predators, who are fighting for world domination, markets, and, quote, spheres of influence, and the enslavement of nations are false, meaningless, and hypocritical. It is not surprising that, quote, socialists who are in favor of defending the fatherland are afraid to recall or to exactly quote the Basel Manifesto, for it exposes their hypocrisy. The Basel Manifesto proves that socialists who stand for the, quote, defense of the fatherland in the 1914 to 1915 war are socialists only in word and chauvinists in deed. They are social chauvinists. Recognition of this war as connected with national liberation leads to one line of socialist tactics. Recognition of a war as imperialist, predatory, and aggressive leads to another line. The latter has been clearly defined in the Basel Manifesto. The war, it says, will evoke an, quote, economic and political crisis, which, it continues, must be, quote, utilized to, quote, hasten the collapse of the rule of capital. These words recognize that social revolution is ripe, that it is possible, that it is approaching in connection with the war. The, quote, ruling classes are afraid of a, quote, proletarian revolution, says the manifesto, quoting the example of the Paris Commune and of 1905, i.e. the examples of revolutions, strikes, and civil war. It is a lie for anybody to say that the socialists, quote, have not discussed or, quote, have not decided the question of their attitude towards the war. The Basel Manifesto has decided this question. It has mapped out the line of tactics, that of proletarian revolutionary action and civil war. It would be erroneous to think that the Basel Manifesto is a piece of empty declamation, a bureaucratic phrase, a none too serious threat. Those whom the manifesto exposes are prepared to say such things, but that is not the truth. 
The Basel Manifesto sums up the vast amount of propaganda and agitation material of the entire epoch of the Second International, namely the period between 1889 and 1914. This manifesto summarizes, without any exaggeration, millions upon millions of leaflets, press articles, books, and speeches by socialists of all lands. To declare this manifesto erroneous means declaring the entire Second International erroneous, the work done in decades and decades by all social democratic parties. To brush aside the Basel Manifesto means brushing aside the entire history of socialism. The Basel Manifesto says nothing unusual or out of the ordinary. It provides only and exclusively that which enabled the socialists to lead the masses, recognition of, quote, peaceful work as preparation for a proletarian revolution. The Basel Manifesto repeated what Gesda said at the 1899 Congress, where he ridiculed socialists' ministerialism, manifesting itself in the event of a war for markets, quote, brigandage capitaliste, or capitalist brigandages, or what Kotsky said in 1909 in his pamphlet Der Weg zur Macht, in which he spoke of the end of the, quote, peaceful epoch and the advent of an epoch of wars, revolutions, and the proletariat's struggle for power. The Basel Manifesto incontestably proves the complete betrayal of socialism by those socialists who voted for war credits, joined governments, and recognized the defense of the fatherland in 1914 to 1915. This betrayal is undeniable. It will be denied by hypocrites alone. The only question is, how is it to be explained? It would be unscientific, absurd, and ridiculous to reduce the question to personalities, to refer to Kotsky, Gezda, Plekhanov, and say, even such persons. That would be a wretched subterfuge. Any serious explanation calls in the first place for an economic analysis of the significance of present-day politics, then for an analysis of their fundamental ideas, and finally for a study of the historic trends within socialism. What is the economic implication of, quote, defense of the fatherland in the 1914-15 war? The answer to this question has been given in the Basel Manifesto. The war is being fought by all the great powers for the purpose of plunder, carving up the world, acquiring markets, and enslaving nations. To the bourgeoisie, it brings higher profits, to a thin crust of the labor bureaucracy and aristocracy, and also to the petty bourgeoisie, the intelligentsia, etc., which, quote, travels with the working class movement. It promises morsels of those profits. The economic basis of social chauvinism, this term being more precise than the term social patriotism, as the latter embellishes the evil, and of opportunism is the same, namely an alliance between an insignificant section at the, quote, top of the labor movement and its, quote, own national bourgeoisie directed against the masses of the proletariat, an alliance between the servants of the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie directed against the class that is exploited by the bourgeoisie. Social chauvinism is a consummated opportunism. Social chauvinism and opportunism are the same in their political essence. Class collaboration, repudiation of the proletarian dictatorship, rejection of revolutionary action, obeisance to bourgeois legality, non-confidence in the proletariat, and confidence in the bourgeoisie. The political ideas are identical, and so is the political content of their tactics. Social chauvinism is the direct continuation and consummation of Millerandism, Bernsteinism, and British liberal labor policies, their sum, their total, their highest achievement. Throughout the entire period between 1889 and 1914, two lines in socialism, the opportunist and the revolutionary, are to be seen. Today, there are also two lines in socialism. Let us not follow the method of referring to persons, which is practiced by the bourgeois and opportunist liars, and let us take the trends to be seen in a number of countries. Let us take ten European countries, Germany, Britain, Russia, Italy, Holland, Sweden, Bulgaria, Switzerland, Belgium, and France. In the first eight countries, the division into the opportunist and revolutionary trends coincides with the division into social chauvinists and revolutionary internationalists. The main nuclei of social chauvinism in the social and political sense are 
Sozialistische Monatschefte and Co. in Germany, the Fabians and the Labour Party in Britain, the Independent Labour Party entered in a bloc with both, the influence of social chauvinism in the latter being considerably stronger than in the British Socialist Party, in which about three-sevenths are internationalists, namely 66 to 84. Nasha Zarya and the Organizing Committee, as well as Nasha Diello in Russia, Bisaladi's party in Italy, Trollsta's party in Holland, Branting and Co. in Sweden, the Shiroki in Bulgaria, Groilich and his people in Switzerland. It is from revolutionary social democrats in all these countries that a more or less sharp protest has emanated against social chauvinism. Two countries out of the ten are the exception, but even there, internationalists are weak, but not absent. The facts are rather unknown. Veillant has admitted receiving letters from internationalists, which he did not publish, then non-existent. Social chauvinism is a consummated opportunism. That is beyond doubt. The alliance with the bourgeoisie used to be ideological and secret. It is now public and unseemly. Social chauvinism draws its strength from nowhere else but this alliance with the bourgeoisie and the general staffs. It is a falsehood for anybody, including Kautsky, to say that the, quote, masses of proletarians have turned towards chauvinism. Nowhere have the masses been asked with the exception, perhaps, of Italy, where a discussion went on for nine months prior to the declaration of war, and where the masses were also against the Bissalati party. The masses were dumbfounded, panic-stricken, disunited, and crushed by the state of martial law. The free vote was a privilege of the leaders alone, and they voted for the bourgeoisie and against the proletariat. It is ridiculous and monstrous to consider opportunism an inner party phenomenon. All Marxists in Germany, France, and other countries have always stated and insisted that opportunism is a manifestation of the bourgeoisie's influence over the proletariat, that it is a bourgeois labor policy, an alliance between an insignificant section of near-proletarian elements and the bourgeoisie. Having for decades to mature in conditions of, quote, peaceful capitalism, opportunism was so mature by 1914-15 to 15 that it proved an open ally of the bourgeoisie. Unity with opportunism means unity between the proletariat and its national bourgeoisie, i.e. submission to the latter, a split in the international revolutionary working class. We do not say that an immediate split with the opportunists in all countries is desirable or even possible at present. We do say that such a split has come to a head, that it has become inevitable, is progressive in nature, and necessary to the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat and that history, having turned away from, quote, peaceful capitalism towards imperialism, has thereby turned towards such a split. Fate leads the willing, but drags the unwilling. Since the onset of the war, the bourgeoisie of all countries, the belligerents in the first place, have united in lauding socialists who recognize the, quote, defense of the fatherland, i.e. the defense of the bourgeoisie's predatory interests in the imperial war against the proletariat. See how this basic interest of the international bourgeoisie is making its way into the socialist parties, into the working class movement, to find expression there. The example of Germany is particularly instructive in this respect, since the epoch of the Second International saw the growth of the greatest party in that country. But the very same thing is to be seen in other countries, with only minor variations in form, aspect, and outward appearance. In its issue of April 1915, Preußische Jahrbücher, a conservative German journal, published an article by a social democrat, a member of the Social Democratic Party, who concealed his identity behind the pseudonym of Monitor. This opportunist blurted out the truth regarding the substance of the policy pursued by the entire world bourgeoisie towards the working class movement of the 20th century. The latter can neither be brushed aside nor suppressed by brute force, he says. It must be demoralized from within by buying its top section. It was exactly in this manner that the Anglo-French bourgeoisie has been acting for decades by buying up the trade union leaders, the Millerons, the Briands, and co. It is in this manner that the German bourgeoisie is now acting. The Social Democratic Party's behavior, Monitor says, too, and in essence in the name of the bourgeoisie, is, quote, irreproachable in the present war 
i.e. it is irreproachably serving the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. The process of the transformation of the Social Democratic Party into a national liberal labor party is proceeding excellently. It would, however, be dangerous to the bourgeoisie, Monitor adds, if the party were to turn to the right. Quote, it must retain the character of a workers' party with socialist ideals. On the day it gives that up, a new party will arise to take up the rejected program, giving it still a more radical formulation, unquote. These words openly express that which the bourgeoisie has always and everywhere done covertly. Quote, radical words are needed for the masses to believe in. The opportunists are prepared to reiterate them hypocritically. Such parties as the social democratic parties of the Second International used to be are useful and necessary to the opportunists because they engendered the socialists' defense of the bourgeoisie during the 1914 to 1915 crisis. Exactly the same kind of policy as that of the German monitor is being pursued by the Fabians and the liberal trade union leaders in Britain and the opportunists and the Jarrisists in France. Monitor is an outspoken and cynical opportunist. Then there is another shade, a covert or, quote, honest opportunist. Engels was right when he once said that the, quote, honest opportunists are the most dangerous to the working class movement. Kautsky is an example of such an opportunist. In De Neue Zeit, number 9 of November 26, 1915, he wrote that the majority of the official party was violating its program. Kautsky himself upheld the policy of the majority for a whole year after the outbreak of the war, justifying the, quote, defense of the fatherland lie. Quote, opposition to the majority is growing, he said. The masses are, quote, in opposition. Kautsky wants to represent the golden mean and to reconcile the, quote, two extremes, which, quote, have nothing in common. Today, 16 months after the outbreak of war, he admits that the masses are revolutionary. Condemning in the same breath revolutionary action, which he calls Abenteuer in den Strassen, or adventurism in the streets, Kautsky wants to, quote, reconcile the revolutionary masses with the opportunist leaders, who have, quote, nothing in common, unquote, with them. But on what basis? On the basis of mere words, on the basis of, quote, left-wing words of the, quote, left-wing minority in the Reichstag. Let the minority, like Kautsky, condemn revolutionary action, calling it adventurism, but it must feed the masses with left-wing words. Then there will be peace in the party, unity with the Sudicums, Legions, Davids, and Monitors. But that is Monitors' self-same program in its entirety a program of the bourgeoisie only expressed in dulcet tones and in honeyed phrases. The same program was carried out by Worm as well, when at the session of the Social Democratic Group in the Reichstag, March 18, 1915. He warned the group not to test the patience of the masses too far, as opposition is growing among the masses against the group's tactics. One must remain with the Marxist center. Let us note the acknowledgement on behalf of the, quote, Marxist center, including Kautsky, that the masses were in a revolutionary temper. This was March 18, 1915. Eight and a half months later, on November 26, 1915, Kautsky again proposed that the revolutionary masses be appeased with left phrases. Kautsky's opportunism differs from monitors only in the wording in shades, and the methods of achieving the same end, preservation of the opportunists' influence, i.e. the bourgeoisie's, over the masses, preservation of the proletariat's submission to the opportunists, i.e. the bourgeoisie. Panikuk and Gorder have very properly dubbed Kautsky's stand, quote, passive radicalism. It is verbiage, to quote the French who have had occasion to make a thorough study of this variety of revolutionism from their, quote, homemade models. I would rather prefer to call it covert, timid, saccharine, and hypocritical opportunism. In substance, the two trends in social democracy now disagree, not in words or in phrases. When it comes to the art of blending, quote, defense of the fatherland, i.e. defense of bourgeois plundering, 
with phrases on socialism, internationalism, freedom for the peoples, etc. Vanderveld, Renadel, Semba, Hindman, Henderson, and Lloyd George are in no wise inferior to Ligien, Sudicum, Kautsky, or Hasse. The actual difference begins with a complete rejection of defense of the fatherland in the present war and with acceptance of revolutionary action in connection with the war, during and after it. In this question, the only serious and businesslike one, Kautsky is at one with Kolp and Heine. Compare the Fabians in Britain and the Kautskyites in Germany. The former are almost liberals who have never recognized Marxism. Engels wrote of the Fabians on January 18, 1893, quote, a gang of place hunters, shrewd enough to understand the inevitability of the social revolution, but totally unwilling to entrust this gigantic work to the immature proletariat alone. Their fundamental principle is fear of revolution, unquote. And on November 11, 1893, he wrote, quote, haughty bourgeois, benevolently descending to the proletariat to liberate it from above, if only it is willing to understand that such a raw, uneducated mass cannot liberate itself and can attain nothing without the charity of those clever attorneys, literateurs, and sentimental females, unquote. How far from these the Kautskyites seem to be in their theory. In practice, however, in their attitude towards the war, they are quite identical. This is convincing proof of how the Marxism of the Kautskyites has withered, turned into a dead letter, a piece of cant. The following instances will reveal the kind of obvious sophisms used by the Kautskyites since the outbreak of war to refute the tactics of revolutionary proletarian action, as unanimously adopted by the socialists in Basel. Kautsky advanced his theory of, quote, ultra-imperialism. By this, he meant the substitution of, quote, joint exploitation of the world by internationally united finance capital for the struggle of capital of some nations against that of other countries, unquote. At the same time, Kautsky himself added, quote, can such a new phase of capitalism be at all achieved? Sufficient premises are still lacking to enable us to answer this question, unquote. On the ground that a new phase is, quote, conceivable, Though he himself lacks the courage even to declare it, quote, achievable, he now rejects the revolutionary tasks of the proletariat at a time when the phase of crisis and war has obviously arrived. Revolutionary action is rejected by the self-same leader of the Second International who, in 1909, wrote a book entitled Der Weg zur Macht. Translated into almost all the principal European languages, the book revealed the connection between the impending war and the revolution and proved that, quote, revolution cannot be premature. In 1909, Kautsky proved that the epoch of, quote, peaceful capitalism had passed and that the epoch of wars and revolutions was at hand. In 1912, the Basel Manifesto made this view the basis of the entire tactic of the world socialist parties. In 1914, war came, followed by the, quote, economic and political crisis foreseen at Stuttgart and Basel. At this juncture, Kautsky invented theoretical, quote, subterfuges to be used against revolutionary tactics. Axelrod has advanced the same ideas, only clothed in a phraseology a little more to the, quote, left. He writes in Free Switzerland, and it is his desire to exert an influence on Russian revolutionary workers. In his pamphlet, Die Krise und die Aufgaben der Internationalen Sozialdemokratie, Zurich, 1915, we find a discovery that is so pleasing to the opportunists and the bourgeois of the whole world, namely that, quote, the problem of internationalizing the labor movement is not identical with the question of revolutionizing the forms and methods of our struggle. And that, quote, the gist of the problem of internationalizing the proletarian movement for freedom lies in the future development and internationalization of everyday practices. For instance, labor protection and insurance legislation must become the object of workers' international action and organizations, unquote. It goes without saying that such internationalism has the full approval not only of the Sudicums, Legions, and Hinmans, together with the Vandervelds, but also of the Lloyd Georges, Naumans, and Briands. 
Axelrod defends Kautsky's, quote, internationalism without even quoting or analyzing any of the latter's arguments for defense of the fatherland. Like the Francophile social chauvinists, Axelrod is even afraid to mention that it is revolutionary tactics that the Basel Manifesto speaks of. Against the future, the uncertain and unknown future, Axelrod is prepared to advance the most left-wing and blatantly revolutionary phrases, such as saying that the future international will meet the governments in the case of a war danger, quote, with the release of a revolutionary storm, the inauguration of the socialist revolution, unquote. And then he fulminates against the utopian Bakunin quite in the spirit of Kolp, Heine, Sudikum, and Legion. The example of Russia exposes Axelrod most strikingly. Four years elapsed between 1901 and 1905, and nobody could guarantee in 1901 that the revolution in Russia, the first revolution against absolutism, would take place four years later. Prior to the social revolution, Europe is in exactly the same situation. Nobody can tell whether the first revolution of this kind will come about in four years. That a revolutionary situation, however, actually exists is a fact that was predicted in 1912 and became a reality in 1914. The 1914 demonstrations of workers and starving citizens in Russia and Germany also undoubtedly, quote, proclaims the approaching decisive battles. It is the bounden duty of socialists to support and develop such demonstrations and every kind of, quote, revolutionary mass action, economic and political strikes, unrest among the troops, right up to insurrection and civil war, furnish them with clear slogans, create an underground organization and publish underground literature, without which the masses cannot be called upon to rise up in revolution, help them get a clear understanding of the revolution and organize for it. It is in this way that the Social Democrats acted in Russia in 1901 on the eve of the bourgeois revolution which began in 1905 but has not ended even in 1915. In the very same way, the Social Democrats are obliged to act in Europe in 1914-1915 quote, on the eve of the Socialist Revolution. Revolutions are never born ready-made. They do not spring out of Jupiter's head. They do not kindle at once. They are always preceded by a process of unrest, crises, movements, revolts, the beginnings of revolution, the latter not always developing to the very end, if, for instance, the revolutionary class is not strong enough. Axelrod invents pretexts so as to distract social democrats from their duty of helping develop the revolutionary movements burgeoning within the existing revolutionary situation. Axelrod defends the tactics of David and the Fabians while masking his own opportunism with left-wing phrases. Quote, it would be madness to wish to turn the world war into a civil war, writes David, leader of the opportunists, in objecting to the manifesto of the Central Committee of Our Party, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which was published on November 1, 1914. The manifesto advanced the Civil War slogan, adding, quote, However difficult such a transformation may seem at any given moment, socialists will never relinquish systematic, persistent, and undeviating preparatory work in this direction once war has become a fact, unquote. It is noteworthy that a month before David's book appeared, May 1, 1915, our party published resolutions on the war which advocate systematic, quote, steps towards turning the present imperialist war into a civil war, unquote, these steps being defined in the following way. One, refusal to vote for war credits, etc. Two, rejection of Bergfrieden, or a class peace. Three, formation of an underground organization. Four, support for fraternization by the men in the trenches. Five, support for every kind of revolutionary mass action by the proletariat in general. O oh, brave David, in 1912 he did not think it, quote, madness to refer to the example of the Paris Commune. In 1914, however, he was echoing the bourgeois outcry of, quote, madness. Plekhanov, a typical representative of the social chauvinists of the quadruple entente, has given an appraisal of revolutionary tactics, which is fully in accord with David's. 
He has called the idea on, to wit, the eve of the social revolution, from which a period of four years or more may elapse before the decisive battles. These are, in fact, the first beginnings, weak as yet, but beginnings nevertheless, of the, quote, proletarian revolution, which the Basel Resolution spoke of, and which will never become strong suddenly, but will inevitably pass through the stages of relatively weak beginnings. Support for and the development, extension, and intensification of revolutionary mass action and the revolutionary movement, the creation of an illegal organization for propaganda and agitation in this direction, so as to help the masses understand the movement and its tasks, methods, and aims. These are the two points that any practical program of social democratic activity in the present war must inevitably boil down to. All the rest is opportunist and counter-revolutionary phrases, no matter what leftist, pseudo-Marxist, and pacifist contortions those phrases may be disguised with. Whenever exclamations like the following are made in protest to us, all this in the usual fashion of the diehards in the Second International, quote, Oh, those Russian methods. We reply merely by referring to the facts. On October 30, 1915, several hundred women demonstrated in front of the Partei Vorstand and sent it the following message through a deputation. Quote, With the existence of a big machine of organization, it would be far easier to distribute illegal leaflets and pamphlets and to hold banned meetings than it was during the anti-socialist law. There is no shortage of means and methods, but there seems to be a lack of determination. I suppose these Berlin women workers must have been led astray by the, quote, Bakuninist, and quote, adventurist, quote, sectarian, see Kolp and Co., and, quote, reckless manifesto of the Russian Party's Central Committee, dated November 1st. And that is the end of the audiobook. This, again, has been Lenin's Opportunism and the Collapse of the Second International. This part of the basic Marxism-Leninism course is a section on Lenin's texts against opportunism and revisionism. Again, opportunism is when socialists work with people who are not socialists and will work to deceive and undermine and crush socialists, in other words, capitalists. And um, revisionism is when people abandon the struggle for socialism generally. A couple of other notes here. I'm not sure that the United States really ever has been in a revolutionary situation previously. I kind of suspect that one is coming about. Um, what we saw here in 2020, now 40 years into neoliberalism and 20 years into the war on terror, which I see as like the second tier of um, you know imperial austerity capitalism, like it's just... They're tightening it up further and further, using more and more just naked force, really upping the rhetoric and just becoming that much more brazen in terms of the way that the capitalists are assaulting the proletariat in every conceivable way of our lives. Uh, being this far into, you know, the, the end of the class piece, which, you know, Lenin talked about the class piece here, that was about the 1930s to the 1970s. Let's say 1935 to 75 for just, you know, ease of uh, estimation. But definitely by the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the class piece was decidedly off and the capitalists uh, started to retract all of the concessions that they had made previously by rolling out neoliberalism, which was a uh, agenda of deregulation, privatizing and defunding. Uh, basically all of the concessions and programs that they had put out there to sort of shore up uh, workers' support for capitalism. That was rolled back as soon as they felt it was politically advantageous for them to do, which is why we shouldn't support opportunist-type work. It will always backfire. It prolongs the struggle. So, But what we see in 2020 is, I believe, a completely historically unprecedented situation in the United States where you had simultaneous riots and uprisings going on in dozens of cities all across the United States, of course, spread, you know, news of which and footage of which was spread uh, and inspiration was spread through social media. So, I, I mean, I personally found that very inspiring. I just started doing this channel a few months prior to that. And, uh, you know, around the Bernie Sanders moment, um, that, of course, failed. He rolled over a second time for the Democratic Party 
very opportunistic, uh, which he he still has yet to really explain or even you know he just he did his job and faded back into the shadows. Bernie Sanders did quite quite astounding, honestly. Even even by these standards, it's quite quite astounding uh, performance there. So, uh, but then you know, of course, with COVID and everything, people were being paid to stay home. What did we do? Well, with time on our hands, people took to the streets. Uh, of course, the murder of George Floyd on camera, uh, slow, brutal, horrible thing, uh, was the flashpoint. But you're talking about decades worth of grievances that suddenly came to the surface and people really, I mean, acted accordingly. That sentiment is still there. I mean, you know, from what I've seen online, there is no love for Joe Biden. It was literally like people don't even think anything's going to change. They just literally wanted somebody else, not Trump. Now, I mean, that may actually backfire because Trump was horribly incompetent and Joe Biden is going to install more competent imperialists. That's not a good thing. I'm not saying one is necessarily better than the other, but... um, I think that workers getting real invested in, you know, making that decision, which really is a question for the bourgeoisie, it, it's their candidates and it's their system. Uh, I think really that's more the way that we ought to be looking at that. The, the choice between Biden and Trump is a question for the bourgeoisie. It's none of our concern. Our concern is building socialism. So are we in a time of peace? Are we in a time, you know, are, are we in a revolutionary moment? We may be in a transition between the two. I think it's, you know, I, I want to use the phrase, it's too early to say, but things happened real fast this summer. And this may be the beginning of a process that might take five years, it might take 10 years, it might take 15 years. But it seems to me that people in the U.S. have like, you know, the ruling class has been kicking the can down the road for a while. Um, it seems now we have reached a pile of cans that cannot be kicked anymore. I just don't think the proletariat can be squeezed pra- in a practical sense any harder than we've b- been squeezed, especially by the COVID situation. So Lenin was talking in this document about, you know, in the 19 teens um, and the sort of like first world war situation that was brewing of this contest between imperialist powers to, you know, carve up the world. Um, Lenin was suggesting that, you know, at the time of storms uh, was coming, that cap- the era of peaceful capitalism has ended. Well, of course, we got a major truce uh, after the establishment of the Soviet Union. Many of the Western uh, capitalist countries, North America, Europe, decided to institute a kind of class peace um, as a kind of, you know, to prop themselves up as a bulwark and a protection against, um, you know, they're trying to buy workers out. They're trying to buy workers complacency and instill an opportunistic mindset of like, oh, hey, we can get uh, health care. We can get minimum wage. Oh, they'll let us unionize. Well, you know, the bourgeoisie is doing that because it's useful to them. Um, They don't want socialism. So, as I said in one of my other videos, you're faced, if you really break it down, with two options. Option A, leave the people who are currently in power in power. Leave them in power. These are people who have a long history of systematic violence against you, the working class, and then particular you know, races and ethnicities and genders within that in different ways and to different extents. And so you can leave them in power and just try to get a few concessions, which probably they'll retract as soon as it is politically feasible for them to do. Or option B, we remove them from power and then we take over and we change the entire system so that there is no more bourgeoisie anymore. People can't get that kind of advantage over each other. Obviously, option B is the more desirable. Now, we can talk about the attainability and the different ways to do that. That's one of the things that this channel is about. But, you know, step one, getting away from opportunism, getting away from the idea of working within the Democratic Party, that is never going to happen. If you're registered as a Democrat, unregister now, register as green or something else, but definitely get out of the, obviously not a Republican either, get out of the bourgeois parties. If you're going to register for a party at all, register for green. Um, It will be one more sign of, uh, you know, discontent. 
and a sign of strength in numbers. Ultimately, though, elections are not maybe maybe a little bit on the local level, you know, could be some help to people. But elections are not how this thing largely is going to be fought. It's going to be mass direct action of the kind that we saw this summer and expanding on what happened this summer. That hopefully was just the beginning of a process that uh, we as socialists definitely need to help lead the way on. Those of us who have more class consciousness, have studied the system, know the facts on the ways that the bourgeoisie is screwing us, we need to help you know, educate people. If you think you've got it in you, start a channel, uh, you know, distribute literature, join a party, help the party work, um, et cetera, because there is massive unrest coming. Uh, we may be leaving the time of peaceful capitalism as, you know, the COVID crisis and other crises deepen. Uh, I personally believe there's going to be another 2008, but much, much, much worse. And that this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg, what we're experiencing now. And with that, I'm going to leave it there for this video. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. These are the November 2020 patrons. If you'd like to become a patron for December 2020 or whenever you're watching this, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and support the channel for as little as $2 a month. Also, make sure to like, share, subscribe here on YouTube. Send this video to your Discord groups, Reddit servers, wherever you're online. We are also rebuilding on Facebook, facebook.com slash socialism the number for all we used to be socialism for all and that page got throttled to death by facebook i don't think it's ever coming back so started a new one it's currently at like 100 likes and growing we will see what happens thanks and we will catch you in the next video